Chair and CEO of Loci Controls, so that's what he's doing post awesome. um, this wonderful thing. All right. Well, <laughs> hopefully that comes at the end of my talk, not at the beginning of the talk. Um, all right, well, so thanks for having me. Um, I've got a slide deck here that there's probably a lot of um, sort of detailed kind of technical plots that may not make a ton of sense. I'm going to try not to get too bogged down into the details, um, hoping to have more of a discussion at the end with, uh, you know, some of the interesting points that come up. And um, please feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions. Uh, more than happy to talk. So uh, for my thesis and my project for the Tata program, uh, we were looking at solar-powered uh, DC microgrids. And so I was doing a technical and economic analysis of these microgrids, and specifically a comparison between uh, small microgrid and um, individual solar home systems or solar lanterns. So kind of the drivers uh, between the, the two systems. And all, you know, from a technical standpoint and from an economic standpoint, so our work was kind of loosely based on a company called Miragao. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Um, they are operating similar kind of business in uh, northern India. Um, it's a couple hundred villages that they've got these microgrids set up. And they've got, done some really interesting things with um, the technology, but more so the business model and the operations and the way that they uh, run and operate the system. So. Uh, yeah, that's the basis for the work. So the research motivation, I don't think I, I need to get into too much of this uh, with you guys, but you know, if you've been to India, if you've seen the situation on the ground, um, you know, electrification is a huge problem. And uh, you know, the government statistics will tell you one story, but then the reality on the ground is, is you know, even worse than the official statistics. So, we're looking at villages of uh, less than 300 inhabitants. So typically, with the kind of system that I was looking at, you'd have probably 30 to 50 connected households. Um, and uh, we're kind of comparing this sort of business to what gets subsidized by the, the government's uh, remote village electrification program, uh, which are these uh, individual solar home systems. So we're kind of looking at the base of the base of the pyramid, like the lowest level of load support uh, that you could think of, um, the lowest cost solution that you can come up with. Um, so this is kind of an interesting picture. This is one of the Miragao villages that we visited. We went to a bunch of their villages to look at their operations and their uh, installations. And uh, so this is a system where Miragao has set up a microgrid and they're a private utility. They're selling uh, lighting and uh, mobile phone charging as a service. And if you notice, there's actually a power pole um, in this village. The problem, of course, is that there's no electricity running on the wires. Um, and, you know, we saw this just all over the place. You have poles with uh, wires and no power, you have poles with no wires because there was no power and after six months the villagers climbed up on the wire, on the, the poles and cut down the wires and sold the material for scrap, this kind of thing. So um, what we're looking at uh, doesn't fit sort of neatly into the unelectrified village category. It's kind of just a general system that you could use to provide uh, basic service. So for my thesis, um, I did this technical and economic modeling. So um, basically, the technical model of the system is really simple. It's basically a bank of solar panels, um, a charge controller, and a battery, and DC distribution lines out to the individual customers. So you're looking at 30 to 50 customers, like I said. Um, each customer has a load, which is uh, a couple of LED lights and a mobile phone charger. And there's some randomness to that load, you know, whether or not they've got the mobile phones um, plugged in or not. Um, but it's not a huge degree of randomness in the grand scheme of things. The economic model for this enterprise that we're studying is that uh, the microgrid utility owns all of the hardware. Um, they're responsible for all of the capital costs of the equipment, um, all of the operations and maintenance costs. So uh, field crews to do you know, routine repairs, um, you know, collections agents to go around to the villages to collect the utility payments, 
kind of all of that stuff is wrapped up into one fee, a flat fee per month. So each household um, with the Mirror Gauss system basically pays, uh, it's like 50 rupees a month, so like a dollar a month. Um, and for that, they get these two LED lights and a mobile phone charger. So that's kind of the microgrid model that we're analyzing. Um, we're comparing that to the solar home system, which is basically a company that's doing the exact same thing, but rather than using um, the microgrids, they're using individual households. So. Um, the end users, you showed um, pictures of a fan and one of the laptops, the yep. one laptop and a couple, of, like a TV maybe. Yep. Was that rolled into the monthly fee? Yeah, so, so, so for my kind of my base case of analysis is just the mobile phones and the lighting. And um, part of the later chapters of my thesis, we're looking at extending the model. So, you know, what's the maximum level of support that you can provide? And how much does your monthly fee need to increase in order to support that level of load? Um, so that's an extension to the model that I looked at, but it wasn't the base. Uh, yeah, so basically comparison of the microgrid to the solar home system. Um, so kind of just, let's jump right into the results. So basically what I found is that um, for villages above a certain size, um, maybe 10 or so customers, uh, microgrid is significantly cheaper way to implement and provide this level of service. And there's kind of three big, big reasons for this. Um, so the first is that uh, the individual component costs fall as the components get bigger. So um, part of what I did was uh, sample some databases of uh, prices for solar panels and um, you know, batteries and charge controllers. And kind of what you see when you look at normalized prices, so like the dollar per watt as a function of panel size, is that it falls off really fast. And so if you've got a solar home system that's designed to deliver 10 watts or 15 watts, you're basically buying the most expensive uh, solar panel that you could possibly buy. So even if you can just aggregate a few customers, um, you're down into the 100 watt panel size, which you know, per unit of output uh, is much, much cheaper. So that's a big part. Uh, that affects the upfront kind of capital costs. Um, the second big area of savings is in the operational efficiencies. So um, in my thesis, a lot of what I was looking at was uh, total costs and how those costs are broken out into different cost factors. So you've got the uh, upfront cost of the equipment, you've got maintenance costs, so replacement costs for individual components, you've got uh, operations costs, so the technicians and, uh, you know, you need to provide them a way to travel around from village to village and you need to provide them training. and. Uh, also, uh, same thing with people who are gonna collect the service fees. So if you look at um, a microgrid, the percentage of cost that's attributable to operations and maintenance, you know, as your village gets bigger, as you're serving more customers with one installation, um, your operation and maintenance cost for that installation is not really increasing that much. How are you accounting for one in these systems? Well, so, um, what we did was, uh, this is kind of a complicated <laughs> question, so I don't want to get uh, too, too detailed, okay. but basically um, you have a, a workforce that you're sort of hiring and you're training and you're bringing on and you're paying them. Uh, and each field crew, for instance, is responsible for maintaining 15 systems or 20 systems. Okay. So you're incurring um, kind of monthly costs that scale as the number of workers scales, and then that number scales as the number of systems scale. And so um, the interesting thing about microgrids is that it doesn't really matter if a, customer, if a village has 20 customers or 50 customers, because the thing that drives the cost is getting the workers out there to diagnose the problem and then fixing the problem. Um, so, you know, that's the exact opposite of the scenario where you've got uh, single home systems because if there's 50 single home systems, then there's 50 systems to diagnose and 50 different problems. Right. Whereas in a microgrid, if you have a component failure, it's one failure that affects everybody. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. did you look at um, doing system reliability over time? 
Yeah, so what we did was um, basically in modeling the cost, we um, had uh, for replacement costs and component lifetimes and everything, we kind of had um, sort of nominal values for the lifetimes of each component, and then you kind of assume that you're going to incur replacement costs for those components at, you know, as they occur over time. And uh, for all of the modeling that I did, we were looking over uh, basically a 10 year horizon, and then um, you know, bringing all of those costs back to you know, present day dollars. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask about your, also you can have costs, and um, you know, uh, different models for you know, employees, whether they were going to be part time or full time, all of them. Yeah, so we, we kind of assumed that everybody was going to be a, um, a full time employee, and we basically modeled the hiring decisions as you know, from a sort of 10,000 foot view uh, as a company. So, um, you know, uh, one team of maintenance workers can maintain 20 systems in 20 villages. And when I get my 21st village, then I need to hire another team of people. So sort of that level of uh, aggregation. I think um, that's actually a little bit different from the way that Miragao was paying their workers. Um, Miragao was actually paying their workers on a sort of per day. So they, they were not of the scale um, where you have enough work for everybody every single day. <laughs> right? So what I was looking at was a, a system where we're scaling out to 10,000 or 15,000 villages. And you know, that the way that we looked at it is only really applicable if you're at a scale such that you, 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 can, you can do that. <laughs> So the operational efficiencies are a big factor in cost savings. And then the, the last thing is the over-specification uh, problem, I call it. So if you have uh, a solar home system that's designed to provide uh, you know, five watts of lighting and mobile phone charging, then you need a battery and a panel that are big enough to provide five watts of lighting and solar uh, mobile phone charging for however many hours a day. And if you have 30, customers, then you need 30 times that capacity. But in, uh, in a grid, obviously, you have some load aggregation, and not all of your customers are going to be using all of the load all at the same time. So as a result, uh, you know, the, the bigger that you can make your systems, the more you can, um, you, you have better capacity utilization of the panels and the batteries that you have in a small field. All right, so yeah, I'll probably just make that. Sounds like probably want to build some sort of smart micro grid. Mm -hmm. Are what, what I'm also curious about is uh, how, how to give up to handle you know, uh, when the customers you know, exceed what you information to them. Uh, how do you manage it? Because that, that's a real challenge. Yeah, that's a that's a huge challenge. And and uh, the nice thing about the systems that we were looking at is that we basically weren't concerned with that because. Um, we're modeling a company that's providing lighting and mobile phone charging as a service, so they're not selling electricity. And as a result, um, you know, the, the enterprise, the company, provides the lights and the mobile phone, and those are the only two loads that there are. Um, but, but you're absolutely right, though. That's a, that's a huge, huge simplification of what is otherwise a really tricky problem. I know in other areas, in Indian, are there's huge problems with like siphoning of power. Yep. With these guys running in the same problems, like they say, they're just providing lights and mobile phone charger and their people. No, so so they um, they would have so for a, a village, you would sort of centrally locate the the batteries and the solar panels, and then you'd have uh, maybe two or three distribution lines that go out, and on each distribution line, they're monitoring the current on that line, and they know what the maximum current is. Right. Um, you know, assuming everybody was using the full load. And if it goes, you know, more than 10% or 20% over that current, they basically cut off that line. Um, and it's actually an effective way of dealing with the problem because if somebody is stealing power, um, it affects everybody that's on that line. So you, you're kind of leveraging uh, social connections within the community to sort of ensure that, that people aren't, you know, stealing power. Do you have people monitoring? Like manually, or well, I guess giving back the current table. No, no, no. I mean, they just install the yeah. you know breaker on each line, and sure. you know if it exceeds a certain amount, uh, the breaker flips, and then 
you need the technician to come by and unlock the box to get in and reset the breaker. So, you know, they, they, the, typically, in talking with the guys from Miragao, what their experience was that uh, this might happen a few times early on, but then people realized that, you know, if I do this, the power gets cut out, and then it's two days before they send somebody out to fix it, and then the problem just kind of takes care of itself. All right, so moving on. Um, so the, the framework of my analysis was uh, you know, this technical model that's linked through some component cost databases into an economic model. Um, so the inputs in the technical model are things like the number of customers, the load profile, um, the wire distribution characteristics, um, distribution voltage, et cetera. That goes into the component sizing. Um, so, you know, depending on the number of customers and the load, you need to buy different panels, and then that links with the, the cost models that I was talking about before. And then uh, that output of this model is sort of a system COGS model, and that determines um, replacement costs and failure rates and things, which then goes into the actual business model of the enterprise. And this is where you're talking about the cash in as opposed to maintenance costs out. Um, and the cost breakdown between the different components of cost. Why did you choose to have uh, wire gauge and distribution voltage as inputs? Um, so what I modeled in, in my base case was uh, the Miragao system, which is um, a 24 volt battery and DC distribution. And that works great when you're powering um, two watts of LEDs and a two and a half watt mobile phone. But if you want to power a, a 10 watt TV, and it's at the end of the distribution line, and you've got 24 volt DC distribution, uh, it turns out that the distribution efficiency um, starts to get really bad. And you know it might be scalable to 10 watts, but if you want to go to 50 watts or 100 watts, um, distribution efficiency just falls off a cliff. So in my technical model, um, I wanted to explore sort of the the limitations of the system, like how far you can, you can push the load. Um, so that's why you had those as, as inputs. Uh, so these next couple of slides are just some um, outputs of the simulations for a kind of typical 30 customer system that I look at. Um, in terms of the component cost itself, these systems are so, so simple. Um, that it's it's actually remarkably cheap. So you know, for a thousand dollars, you can install a bank of batteries and panels big enough, and provide all of the load devices and the wiring for a, a 30 customer system. And you know, it's about a third EV panels and a third batteries, and then you know, third everything else. Um, also, now we wanted to look at how. Costs split up between the, you know, O&M costs, the financing costs for all of the equipment, uh, the salary of the workers, the replacement costs of each of the components. So, this is looking at the how the costs break down for microgrids of different sizes, and, you know, basically what we're seeing here is that as your number of customers uh, increases, your operation to maintenance costs as a fraction of the total cost is is shrinking. You know, because of these efficiencies. Um, so, did you assume that all the customers are some nominal distance with each other? I mean, it seems like once they get further and further apart, the microgrid. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we uh, we looked at a system with um, 1,500 foot nominal distribution wire, so a little less than a third of a mile, and then kind of in a radius of that area, and uh, as part of the extension of the model, we started to make those distribution distances longer. But again, because you're doing the low voltage DC distribution, um, it gets unmanageable pretty quickly. Okay. So, yep. How does financing grow as a function of villagers? Um, because for a 70 person village, the upfront cost of the equipment is all much bigger. Right. And so you need to borrow the money to purchase a much bigger system, and then you know, uh, so you end up paying uh, more interest on that. Effectively. Okay. So we're assuming. Okay. 
So we're assuming they're leveraging less than the smaller systems. Just, I'm sorry? We're just assuming they're leveraging less than the smaller systems. Yep. Okay. So you think the transactional costs would be a lot higher for the small group? Uh, yeah, but ba basically by financing, I'm just looking at, you know, uh, so this 70 customer village is going to cost $2,500 or something. And so, you know, when I apply a, the same interest rate to that sum at the end, that's what gets you. Um, so for for your base case where you've got the you know two watts of lighting and the two and a half watt LED, the current for each customer is so low that you you can extend it until the wiring becomes so expensive that it's it's unmanageable. For the scenario where you know the more interesting cases where you want to provide higher levels of load, that's where you get hit by the I squared R losses. Yeah, so so the base case was uh, I think a 1,500 foot radius, and then I looked at various combinations of increasing the load and increasing the distance, and I, I kind of only went out to about uh, 3,000 foot radius, because if you combine, uh, you know, doubling the load or tripling the load with doubling the the distance, then the uh, the distribution efficiency falls off really fast. It's, it's the corner cases where you're changing both things at the same time that really get you. And, and for all of the, all of the models that I did, um, it's, you've got these distribution lines that are set distances, and then you are randomly populating customers along those lines. So um, it, you run this simulation you know, 10,000 times, and you end up with a distribution. And so uh, the median system distribution efficiency might be something reasonable and then out on the tails it's like are they really good or really bad so if you had all thousand or all 70 customers like right close to the line then this isn't an issue and and I think that's another thing that's uh, it, it's like a knob that you have as a designer of the system um, the the level of uh, support that you're going to provide um, the level of like service reliability so, you know, because you're looking at distributions of outcomes, you can kind of decide what is a reasonable uh, level of support that I'm going to provide. I don't need to design my system to, to handle the 99 percentile, like, worst, worst case. So. And, and that's something that you can't do when you've got a single old system. Right. Uh, I'm Wakar uh, from Pakistan. I'm but, uh, working on renewable energy part for the off-grid communities in Pakistan. In Pakistan and in India, there are similar situations. Uh, the biggest challenge we, we, which we are facing since uh, one decade that communities, rural communities, have uh, less uh, exposure to the operation and maintenance costs. They usually uh, willing to install these type of uh, infrastructure, but at the end, 50% of our installation have some serious issues because of the overhead cost. And what we do is we spare 30% of total cost as an OEM cost, but until then, I mean, 30% uh, is still insufficient for the uh, for, for for them to run their projects. So, uh, if if we take an example of a five household, you first you can first parameter OEM salary or OEM cost, which I assume that it's 61%. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's still feasible? For the rural community, they don't have technical expertise. Uh, well, well, so so these uh, in this model that we're looking at, the O and M costs are uh, workers that work for the utility company that is providing this. Mm -hmm. So the it's not that the the local villagers are repairing and diagnosing the problems with the system. Mm -hmm. And the reason that uh, we look over this range of number of customers is because there is a breakdown. Like there is a, a minimum size village where it's just, if it's smaller than that, like it's just not feasible to have a grid. Okay. So uh, average uh, village size in Pakistan, it would be in India, is 70 plus households mm -hmm. per village. So do you have any model for the villages like uh, 100 plus households? Yeah, so what we're trying to compare against is, is um, 
this remote village electrification program, which um, is specifically targeting uh, villages of less than 300 inhabitants. And so, you know, that works out to about 70 households. You know, three, three, house, three inhabitants per household is probably a drastic underestimation of what, what you actually have. So, you know, we, we kind of looked up to 70 customers per village because um, for villages greater than 300 households, they were subject to electrification under uh, grid extension programs. So it's kind of a apples to oranges comparison for what we're trying to do. Most of these villages are remote. How does it work with the ONM? Where are the ONM people trained? You said from the utility? Yep. Remote? It's really cut off from the rest of the grid. So, how, where are they coming from? How are they Yeah, so it, it's interesting in the, the Miragao case. Um, it's, it's not actually as remote as, as <laughs> you would think it is. Okay. Um, you know, it takes a long time to travel there because the infrastructure is very bad. Yeah. But um, the density of villages was actually uh, fairly high. So the way that Miragao structured it and the way that we kind of modeled it um, is that you would have a regional office that sort of covers, you know, maybe a 20 square kilometer area. And, you know, that is responsible for the maintenance on, you know, the 100 villages or whatever that are in that area. So they're not geographically All right. So um, the main metric that you use to, or that we use to evaluate the cost in these systems is the levelized cost of service, which is effectively, you know, what is the monthly service fee that you need to charge the customers, um, you know, given a set of input parameters that you're looking at. And so um, these plots that we're looking at here are sort of, uh, the flat ones are for solar home systems, and the, the downward sloping ones are for microgrids. And so what you find is that for the microgrids, as you are increasing you know, past 10 or 20 customers per village, uh, because of the operational efficiency that you gain, uh, the levelized costs are, are much, much lower. Um, and you know, for uh, for solar home systems, they also, levelized cost also falls as you achieve scale, but not nearly as fast. Um, this is kind of what I was talking about for uh, distribution efficiency. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, on the previous slide, uh, the second chart was about wages, right? I'm sorry? The wages chart? Yep, yep. Um, what does that translate to and how much the utility workers get paid? Uh, yeah, so so the, the kind of base salary um, for the workers, which again is not exactly how Miraga does it, because they, they would not salary their workers. Um, so the the base salary that we were looking at was something like two thousand or twenty four hundred dollars a year, like two hundred dollars a month. Just, and is that, compar is that comparable in terms of opportunity costs for uh, other economic opportunities available to those? That, that's actually quite a bit more than uh, <laughs> other other opportunities that you would have. I think most of the, in the regions where we were looking, um, most of the people were farming uh, sugar cane. And so it's a, it's a little bit of an apples, uh, apples and oranges kind of thing because um, you know, we modeled our costs as a monthly salary, and, and most people there actually don't earn a monthly wage, so it's not exactly comparable. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm, you may have already spoken about this, but um, the workers are coming from, you just mentioned agriculture, and then I heard utility company. Can you clarify where they're coming from? And then also, um, to the extent that they don't have that technical knowledge, Yep. Sort of what is the cost to get them up to speed? Mm -hmm. So the the workers, like for Miragao, yeah. they uh, recruit all of their workers out of the local villages. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really pretty incredible what they've been able to do in terms of training. So they have gotten their system where it is it's so simple technically that they're able to train workers 
to install and repair and diagnose problems. Like within a day, a week? Or... Uh, no, no, probably within a week or two weeks. Wow. So typically, um, they would have teams um, of you know three three workers, and so if you have a new employee, you might send them out with uh, two experienced people for you know a month or something, and then at the end of that month, you know, kind of know what's going on. But the, we didn't break out specifically the cost for training. Okay. It's kind of just wrapped up into the, the monthly wage. Um, so this was, um, we were looking at what, what's the impact on this levelized cost, this monthly fee of uh, providing support for higher levels of load. Um, and the, the interesting thing here, so for a baseline, you know, we're looking at about a dollar a month for the mobile phone charging and LED lighting. Um, that's this, uh, this blue curve. And so um, the, the interesting thing is that as you scale up to 40, 50 watts per household, um, your costs do increase um, you know, somewhat out, out on the tail. But if you actually look at the levelized cost of energy, so the the way we typically think about energy costs are dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, those costs are actually uh, falling during this time. So your monthly fee is increasing, but the amount that you're paying per unit of electricity is actually falling pretty dramatically. Um, so this is kind of an interesting result. Um, and then again, this is um, looking at distribution efficiency for different load cases. And this was um, using the, the default um, 24 volt DC distribution, 1500 foot lines, <coughs> and uh, these are kind of cumulative probability distributions. So, at for the case where you've got um, 30 customers and they're all drawing two watts, you know, 1500 foot distribution lines, and you're like 98 percent efficient. But if you make that 40, 50 watts per customer with the same lines, you know, you might get median. Um, distribution efficiencies of like 65, 70 percent, and at this point, um, that's a problem in general, is just because you don't like things to be that inefficient. But it's bad because that means that you have to scale all of your components that much bigger, and so it's not just you know this abstract like uh, the efficiency is bad. It's uh, I needed to make my panels and my batteries 30 percent bigger to account for this. So the cost is actually increasing for these low, low efficiency uh, cases as well. Cool. So uh, just to kind of wrap up some of the conclusions, um, you know, falling panel and LED prices have made this kind of model possible today that where, uh, you know, five or, or 10 years ago um, would not have been economically viable to provide this level of service. Um, that benefits both the solar home systems and the, the microgrids that we were looking at. Um, load aggregation, um, as with anything, you know, economies of scale always, always help you. So it helps you in terms of component costs, in terms of operational efficiency and uh, capacity utilization. Um, you know, we found that the subsidies that are currently going towards these solar home systems are probably more effectively distributed towards other models of service. Um, that was a kind of a big recommendation. Um, and, you know, of course, the maintenance is, is really a critical driving factor for all, for all of these systems. So I guess that's the end of my slides, and I'm just happy to have other questions. Um, so the subsidies for solar systems right now, those are given to the customers no, I think usually the way that it works is that um, a third-party company will prepare a project where they say, okay, we're going to go into this village and we're going to provide so many of these systems. And, and as part of that project, they're supposed to have an operations and maintenance plan. So, you know, so it's, it's the, the thought is, is there. You know, it's, it's not just give these systems out and then see what happens. It, I think the problem is enforcing those contracts um, is very, very difficult. So in practice, you tend to see a lot of solar home systems that are out in these villages and, you know, the batteries stop working after 
a year or 18 months, and then that's kind of the end of it. But did it, I'm sorry, I said, oh my so do the customers, what, what they're actually paying for a solar home system model versus the microgrid model, how do those compare? And then also, did you get a sense of the perception of the people of, of which, which type they prefer? Do, do they see solar home systems as um, kind of a better option than having to share a microgrid? Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't do really extensive sort of on-the-ground surveying and getting a sense for that. I mean, I, I've read other studies where they kind of indicate that people would prefer to have their own system. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what people really want is a re reliable service. And so if your option is to have that and it's community-based or to not have it, people would prefer to have it. So. Um, you touched on this before about system sizing, and I was just wondering what you saw in terms of the use pattern. So, you know, you're not, you're not sizing to peak. Mm -hmm. This is kind of funny to talk about. Yeah. Uh, it's like like bolts and stuff, but it's, uh, it's real, right? It's a real challenge, and then you have sort of the gross usage monthly or annually. So, uh, and then maybe Factoring for like the production capacity based on the whatever the efficiency of the panel. So what was the what did you decide on in terms of the size of the system? Yeah, so um, we looked at the the whole distribution in every case of, of the scenario, and then um, you know I I was typically comparing the median points of every distribution just to pick a point, mm -hmm. um, but you could have just as easily drawn all of the curves to, to be serving the, you know, 90% pointer or whatever. The, all the shapes would have been the same, but the numbers would have been different, obviously. Um, I think the practical experience of Miragao on the ground um, was that people would typically have the lights on and uh, just leave them on all night. And the system is on a, a shutoff, so as soon as the sun comes up in the morning, they disconnect all the distribution lines to allow the batteries to, to recharge. Uh, and, um, you know, mobile phone charging is kind of a random variable. Some, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. What's the scope or potential for adding applications, especially for duration? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that that's kind of why we looked at um, some of this distribution efficiency stuff because you you realize that uh, okay if I'm if I'm going past you know 50 or 100 watts something's going to fundamentally have to change about the technical system and um, that's okay you know you can go to higher voltages but it comes at a at a cost and it's not just the cost of the system it's also you know the the whole beauty of this Miragao system is that it's so simple you know the distribution voltage is the battery voltage. So, you know, when your field crews go out there and something's not working, it's like there isn't these extra steps. You know, you don't have to step up to go to distribution and then step down at every household. So if you start to stray too far from kind of the base parameters, then I think it might look good on paper, but there's probably some hidden costs in there that, that are going to bite you. Refrigeration. Um, you know, it is, is one that everybody wants, air conditioning. Um, from Miragao, we also heard that everybody wants TVs. Uh, irrigation pumping uh, is one thing, but I think that the power constraints on that are, are way above what you could reasonably do with a system like this. I'm curious what you mean by fundamentally changing the system design. Well, so, um, you know, if you add, um, like, say your battery is 24 volts, which is nice because it's a couple of 12-volt SLAs, um, and then now you're going to add a step-up converter, and you're going to do your distribution at 72 volts. Well, now every single household has to have a step-down. And instead of a system where I had one panel, one battery, one charge controller, now I've got one panel, one battery, a charge controller, step-up, and... 35 step downs. And so, you know, the your maintenance costs 
because of the number of components in the system is going up so much more. It's it can get tricky. Just like parallel and more batteries. I mean, could you do that to like, serve some of these other villages? I mean, what, is that considered a fundamental change in design? No, no. I, I, I think yeah, doing stuff like that, connecting batteries in series yeah. to step up the voltage is you know within reason is is all probably okay. Um, but yeah, as soon as you start to look at things like AC distribution, um, you know, stepping up to much higher voltages to support the loads, uh, it gets tough. I, I think it's not that it's impossible, it's just that it's kind of outside the scope of the models that we were working with, so. I have a question related to system sizing. For the arrays, for your PV arrays, how did you estimate your solar resources? Is there good data for this? Yeah, there there are pretty good um, pretty good maps. I mean, that's one thing that India does have uh, is pretty good pretty good sun. the The problem that you have is that it's it's hard to talk about like nationwide because you've got certain areas that are hugely affected by monsoons, and then there's no sun for three months. Um, so it's a little bit hard to to have that generalization. But in the area that we were working at, we were looking at a really specific. Uh, state and so that data was was pretty pretty available. And you speak about data gathering. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you maybe face when you're on the ground trying to get this data? Sort of probably us paint a picture of what that's really like. Yeah. So I mean, without um, without a local liaison that is there and has the ties to the people and the ability to translate and you know, ask the questions that you want to ask. It's basically not possible to, to collect data. So, how did you find that local partner? Um, I mean, I, I actually had met the guys at Miragal through some other, you know, networking thing. And then um, when I was doing my, my research, I, I reconnected with them. That's great. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I did find generally, though, that um, People in the space are, are very willing. They, they want to see people succeed, and they want to see people, you know, research it and have interest. So, you know, if you reach out and you ask credible questions, and you know, you're genuinely interested, um, I never contacted anybody and had them not help me. So, do you know if Marigal is like able to operationalize, or if any of these findings are, are informing what they're doing going forward? Yeah, I think that this is basically um, confirming a lot of what they they know from uh, sort of trial and error kind of thing. I, I, I think that Miragao is a startup, and so you know the way that they settled on 24 volt DC distribution is they tried 12 volts, and the, you know the distribution efficiency was too low, and they're having a lot of reliability problems. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, th this is sort of an analytical way of coming at what they probably already know. Um, I think where it can be helpful is in some of the quantitative modeling of how to expand the system and how your cost might scale as you go to bigger distribution, bigger loads, that kind of thing. But, but for the base case of their system, like they know it better than I know it. So. Um, in terms of scaling, maybe other villages, is it risky for them to to try to move into a village that's technically already been electrified, but it's you know just the standing pole with no power on it. No, I mean uh, that that didn't seem to be a, a problem <laughs> at all. I, I would say we visited probably 20 or so of their villages, and at least half had been electrified. Um, you know, like I said, people people want reliable service. I, I will say though, I will say that from the perspective of like the government and regulation, uh, Miragat was very much flying under the radar of uh, regulatory. You know, they basically didn't want anything to do with it because, uh, frankly, a lot of the problems with electricity in India are artificial problems that are created by bad policy. So that that's certainly a risk if you're trying to scale to like nationwide. Well, did they get any incentives or subsidies at all? No, uh, Mirga was not getting any, any incentives at all. So it's not part of the solar 
I'm sorry? Not included in the national solar system? Nope. Nope. They, they basically wanted nothing to do <laughs> with any kind of government uh, involvement. So, and, and if you talk to the guys at Miraga, they are very, very clear that they are not a utility. They do not sell electricity. They are a service provider. And that's important for them, I think, in a lot of ways because um, there's regulatory risk if you're a utility, obviously. Um, but also, uh, from the perspective of the customers, um, you know, customers in a village don't have any concept of what a unit of you know, power is. I don't even know what a unit of power is. Like, what is this? Um, but they sure know what the, the government subsidized rate is on that unit. And so if Miragao was going in there and trying to sell them electricity at this rate, like the villagers will know that that rate is 20 to 50 times higher than what the government has said is the rate for farmers. So they would basically never be able to sell power. You know, but when it's a service and it's um, the way that uh, Miragao talks about it is um, comparing it to kerosene expenditures. So if you look at the typical outlays of, of kerosene, they, they ask a lot of questions from the villagers and try and establish a baseline for what they're spending on kerosene and then say, well, this is providing that same light at half the cost. And that's a very effective, effective tool. Yeah, they kind of have, how are they acquiring customers? How are they scanning, especially in these rural areas? Are you going to be a um, I think in the beginning it was very difficult. I think once they got to um, a scale of, you know, 30 villages or something. Uh, they they were saying that they would go into an area and people already knew about it. Because these villages are not real far apart. It's not like a totally remote scenario. What state are they in? Uh, Uttar Pradesh. Okay. It's um, probably 50, 40 or 50 kilometers south of Lucknow. It's like way up in the corner, kind of almost by Nepal. Is there a sense that this is a finite horizon opportunity in terms of the larger group development? And yeah, I mean, I think that this is, um, it's limited in scope by the economics of the situation, by the technical capacity of the systems. So, I mean, yeah, it, it is definitely a, a finite thing. I think, I think, um, if you talk to the guys at Miragao, they they don't look at it that in quite those terms because you know for them it's it may be a finite thing, but you know the government technically electrified this village seven years ago and there's no power, so you know they're they're trying to provide a level of basic services, you know, to meet a need, and that need is never going to go away. So we should probably stop here um, and allow people, I know we um, a lot